Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I'm going to open it up. Okay. Anyway. You do your thing. It's almost ready. Oh, chocolate. I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes? No? No? Yes? No? Yes? Hey, there I am. Okay. So, ladies, I'm going to give the lecture on chapters 12 and 13, which we all just spent studying, spent time studying. But, you know, I am not going into a ton of detail on some things that maybe are super important to you, but I can tell you I probably studied it. So if you have questions after about something specific, come and talk to me because we would be here till like two o'clock or maybe three if you wanted me to go over all of it. So, okay, so in any sport, right, there's a home team crowd who does whatever they can to um, stop the opposing offense from scoring a goal. So a lot of thought and preparation goes into what they're going to do here. They're going to make banners, they're going to make signs, they're going to uh, make flags, all that kind of stuff. Then they have to get it to the fans, right? So then they've got to distribute it so all the fans can use them at just the right time. And then the fans need to use them at when? Just that right time. When that field goal is being kicked, when someone's going to make a free throw. So what do you do at that critical moment? The loud roar goes up, a sharp horn, or the waving of a terrible towel, Steeler fans. <laughs> no one is a Steeler fan? Come on. No, sorry. It's got to be the Steelers because we have the most Super Bowl rings. Okay, so I digress. So if you do that, sometimes you have the success of preventing that other team from scoring. But no matter how many distractions are presented, the player who's playing and who's trying to make this goal knows one thing, right? He needs to keep his eye on that goal, whatever that might be. And Satan is going to do a lot to, and take a lot of effort to prevent you from scoring your goals or being successful in your life. However, God has enabled us that if we focus on him to be able to make those goals in life, when we make them, they will be good, whatever that is. If it's a touchdown, if it's a basketball game, if it's soccer, whatever. He makes this possible when we keep our eyes on him. So our central idea for this week is although Satan is powerful, he is not God's equal, and God gives us the power to overcome him. And we've got three sections here on our uh, lesson today. So Ah, the great red dragon. I've never looked at a dragon the same after reading this, right? And then we've got the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. Heavenly Father, you go before us today in this scripture that is prophecy, and yet we can see bits and pieces of it alive in our world today. Lord, help us to know your word and to overcome the deception of the evil one. In your name we pray. Amen. So chapter 12 here starts with a sign which indicates that what John was seeing is symbolic or figurative of the reality that was being shown to him. This sign is so comprehensive, though, that it embraces the entire redemption plan. The first sign is a woman, great with child. She is in labor. I believe, as many commentators do, that this woman is representative of the Israel nation, Israeli nation. Um, and that she's going to have this child, and that child is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. She is said to be clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown with 12 stars. So if you remember from Joseph, way back in Genesis, now we're studying the last book, let's go to the first book, Genesis 37, where Israel was symbolized by a sun and a moon and 11 stars, and Joseph was the 12th star. So it's already been foretold something like this was going to be coming. If you have had children, or if you know anybody who's had a child, you know that this scene can be a little chaotic. The delivery room, right? Nothing goes as planned usually. Something always is different. Um, and here we are in this chaotic scene. And so let's make it even more chaotic and bring in something else. Behold, a great red dragon just what you want in your delivery room, with seven heads. Maybe that was your husband. Oh, wait. Seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. Welcome, Satan. I do not want him in my delivery room. 
but my husband will need to leave now. No. His appearance symbolizes power with all of these things on his head, power and authority and intelligence. Fortunately for me, Erica will get to go into a lot more of that in chapter 17, so I'll pass that one off to you. <laughs> but now the action of his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This refers to the circumstances of Satan's fall when he fell, when he came down from heaven and he took some of the angels of heaven with him. We had a discussion today. We didn't want to call them angels because their angels makes you think of heaven and, and cute little chubby angels, right? No, these definitely are not that kind of angel. Uh, we will see in the stance that he's standing at the foot of the bed or wherever she's delivering, aggression and fierce anger awaiting this birth. And Satan, certain, Satan certainly knows who's being born, right? And just as soon as that baby comes out, Satan tries to do whatever he can to destroy him. Historic evidence of Satan's attempts to thwart the messianic promise is abundant. We see it in all of history. He's anti-Semitic and he's anti-Christ. He has nurtured a special hatred for the Jewish people from the days of Pharaoh to Haman in the book of Esther to Hitler to Stalin to today with Iran and Hamas. He would devour Israel in a moment if he could. This is a reminder that as a Christian, you are indestructible until God is done with you. Erica gave us that quote last week from Greg Laurie. God is not done with the nation of Israel yet. This child is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Verse 5 says, She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And we looked at Psalm 2 this week. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm where God the Father is talking to his son, the Messiah. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So it is already predicted back in Psalms that this will occur. I'll take a little break here and go, don't you love Christmas? Where am I going with this? The colors, the lights, the music, the smells, the food, reading of Luke 2, I love it all. I hope you do too. But you know what? These few verses give you a completely different perspective of Christmas. Satan hates Christmas and everything that it represents. We see his hatred today in Happy Holidays, instead of Merry Christmas. Uh, winter Plays, instead of the Christmas story being portrayed. The banning of manger scenes in public places. And even brawls and fights to get that best gift at Walmart and Best Buy. That's all Satan. Genesis 3.15, and we looked at this one too. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Satan knows he's going to be crushed, but he wants to take as many with him as he possibly can. At the cross, Satan was crushed. He was defeated and that's made him more angry than ever. The whole purpose of Christmas was so that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem and would live a perfect life and die on the cross for us and for our sins. The birth of Jesus just happened to make possible the death of Jesus, and that is the real story of Christmas. Back to the story. <laughs> Jesus is then caught up to God, to his throne, and the woman fled to the wilderness which is actually looked at as a place of spiritual refuge and protection from Satan for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Now I'll come back to her later, but for now we're moving on to verses 7 through 12, which describes a war in heaven. Two powerful angels are here warring against each other. Two angels who once delighted to serve the Lord side by side. Once who delighted to serve him together, Michael and Lucifer. What is this celestial conflict all about? Who is greater? Sounds like kids on the playground, right? Lucifer was a high-ranking angel with some kind of responsible for leading worship. And when he rebelled against God, he lost his all-access pass to heaven. 
he is now limited in what he can do. The fact that Michael led God's angels into victory is significant because Michael is often identified with the nation of Israel. We saw that in Daniel 10 and 12 this last fall. But now back here in Revelation 12, verse 9, it says what we already know. The ancient serpent, who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Oh. The name devil means accuser, and Satan means adversary. When the accuser sees that his tactics have failed, he will become angry, super angry, and threaten the very peace of heaven. And one of his strategies is to lie about the church, we are the church, so he's lying about us, and that the people of God are dangerous and deluded and even destructive. This will later band the leaders of the nations together against Christ and his people. But the church of God can always defeat the enemy by being faithful to God and to his word. The triumphant song that was composed and used on this occasion is our memory verse. So ladies, if you haven't already said it five times, we're going to say it again. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before him. Revelation 12.10. Good job. You have chocolate for all of them? Okay, good. <laughs> She's going to start throwing it out now. Well, despite his hatred of the presence of God, he is willing to go in front of God just to accuse the people of God. How was their victory gained? The servants of God overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of, his te of their testimony. Remember Ephesians 6.10, where our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against the supernatural forces of the wicked one? And these have been defeated by our Savior on the cross. And when we are told to put on the armor of God, did you put it on this morning? Heaven will rejoice when Satan is defeated in heaven. But that just means that this last half, these last three and a half years of the tribulation, will mean intense suffering for those who are still in the world. Remember the three woes we have already studied? So the first one was in chapter 9, was the stinging locust that only tormented those who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. The second woe was in chapter 11. It's the releasing of the four uh, angels, which were the four demons who actually killed a third of mankind. And the third woe in the second half of chapter 11 is the arrival of the king, the king of king and lord of lords, and his coming judgments are no longer partial but complete in their destruction. And here we see in verse 12, but woe, another woe, a woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Well, Satan has been kicked out of heaven, so he must vent all of his anger on the earth. Great wrath, which this verse talks about, refers to a violent outburst of rage. The word depicts a turbulent, emotional fury, more than rational anger. This guy's lost it, really. And who's the target? The woman, which, or the, the nation of Israel. She is given supernatural assistance by God in a time of human incapability. They are unable to help Israel, humans are. So God steps in, in supernatural way, and takes her to a specific location that has been set aside for her protection. Where that is, we have no idea. She will stay there for the last half or, um, or the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. Do you remember that when we looked at that study? We are now in that time before that 70th week of Daniel. This is the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, which is three and a half years. The serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. She fled and he's coming after her. That's verse 15. And whether or not this is an actual flood, which it could be, or an outpouring of hatred and anti-Semitic propaganda, or armies that actually invade Israel to destroy the remnant, Psalm 124 is a great parallel chapter to this section of Revelation 12, 15 through 16. I can't go to it, otherwise we'd continue to be here. So look up Psalm 124. 
But again, Satan's plans are thwarted again by the earth's assistance. How cool is that? God's help is manifested through nature. If it truly does swallow up this water and earthquake happens and consumes this and saves it, how cool that nature, who is put there by God, is obeying God and helping her out. Well, that ticked off Satan even more. And he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony, verse 17. This speaks of all Jews who did not escape into the wilderness, believing and unbelieving Jews. But it is specifically the believing Jews around the world that are now his target. There are 144,000 Jews that have been sealed for protection in chapter 7, verses 3 through 8. We saw that. So, but he can still come after them, but it doesn't mean that they will necessarily be harmed. Even Satan can tell the difference between those who keep the commandments of God and those who don't. When he comes to accuse you of not being worthy to approach God, Greg Laurie is great. He said to agree with him. You're right. I am not worthy to approach God, and I never have been, and moreover, I never will be. My access to God's presence is based not on my worthiness, but it is based on what Christ did for me at the cross. That's exactly what Satan doesn't want to hear, because the cross was his death. The devil will always try to keep you from the cross, and the Holy Spirit will always draw you to the cross. My access to God is not a result of what Jesus has done for me. Is, excuse me, is a result of what Jesus has done for me. Period. End of sentence. And what about your testimony? We see that, it's, that they were uh, saved by the blood of the Lamb, which is at the cross. And now our testimony. Just express what the Lord means to you, just like Gay did this morning. Speak up about your faith in Christ, ladies. Tell your personal story of coming to faith in Christ. Identify yourself as a Christian. It's a good way to make yourself accountable, especially to unbelievers. God will give you the power to do that and the right time and the right words. By God's power, our testimony can overcome Satan. Tony Evans tells the story of a woman who bought a very expensive dress very expensive dress. And when she brought it home and her husband found out how much it cost, well, why in the world would you buy a dress like that? He said, it's, you know, so expensive. You know we can't afford this. And so, well, the woman said, but honey, you don't understand. The devil made me do it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I put the dress on and he said, you look good in that dress. And he said, the husband says, well, then why didn't you tell him, get thee behind me, Satan? I did. And he said, I looked good from there, too. <laughs> well, you can't get rid of Satan. He is everywhere. And he has got a good argument ready and waiting for every situation that you'll face. So what? Be prepared. You can overcome him with the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Although Satan is powerful, he is not God's equal, and God gives us the power to overcome him. Section two, the beast from the sea. I wish we had like theme music. Dun, dun, dun. So chapter 13 begins with John using figures again, figures of speech to describe a fantastic vision that God has given him. If you remember, it is similar to how Daniel described what he saw in his visions. Uh, the sea symbolizes the Gentile nations, so this beast is from one of the Gentile nations, and we know that he is not going to be a, of Jewish descent. John describes him with ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Yeah, that was probably the best one. Most of them were like superimposed in front of like real oceans, and that looked really cheesy. So not that this doesn't look cheesy, but you know, it's the best we can do humanly. So this is what Daniel saw in uh, chapter 7. He saw four beasts representing the four world kingdoms. The lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo-Persian, the leopard was Greece and Alexander the Great, and the fourth was Rome. Now all of these creatures or empires are embodied in this now Antichrist. 
And back in chapter 6, the Antichrist starts his career as a peacemaker and even will be able to settle the Arab-Israeli problem, for lack of a better term, by making a covenant with the Jewish nation that will protect them for seven years and they will be able to rebuild their temple. Many will hail him as a Messiah or even the Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah, right? And they think that this will be him. Revelation 13, 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Well, the identical phrase in Greek was used back in chapter 5, verse 6, when it said, a lamb standing as though it had been slain, as though, it says, denotes the appearance after having been slain and being brought back to life. So these are similar appearances, but we know that one is false and one is true. And we know that how? Because we've read God's word and we know truth. As J. Vernon McGee says, this is the greatest delusion Antichrist's fake resurrection is the big lie of the Great Tribulation. Man ignores the force of Jesus' resurrection, but will choose to be fooled by this beast's recovery. Why? Well, Jesus demands righteousness, and this beast will let them indulge in their sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. We looked at this this week as well. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. So simply put, those who turn from the truth of God to the Antichrist and refuse God's free gift of salvation will be turned over to their own self-willed choice. God will confirm their choice and sending a, send a deluding influence upon them. God has given you free will and he will not force you to believe something that you don't want to believe. Now, here in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist breaks this covenant with the Jewish nation and sets himself up in the temple and that the new Jewish nation has just finished rebuilding. I'll talk more about that in the next section. But this is where we are now. Drawing on the raw power of Satan himself, this Antichrist, he will harness the economic and technological power of the world and bring about a one-world economy, a one-world government, and a one-world religion. He will use his power to manipulate, like we don't already see it now, but to point to himself and to promote his evil plans. Don't be misled, ladies. Be on guard by claims of great miracles or reports about a resurrection or a reincarnation of someone claiming to be Christ because when Jesus returns, he will reveal himself to everybody. You won't be questioning that. And in Matthew 24, we looked at that one too. But look at Matthew 24, 23 through 28. He will reveal himself. There will be no question. The word beast describes the Antichrist's character, not his appearance. He is going to be good looking and smart. Every major news outlet will be scrambling to get him on their network. They want to be that first one to break the news. When Jesus... Um, Excuse me, sorry. His purpose was to deify Satan. So he's going to get everybody looking at him, and then he is going to point everything up or down or wherever he will be to Satan. So they worshipped the dragon in verse 4, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This is the very reason that Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. He wanted to be worshipped like God. Once Satan's masterpiece, which is the Antichrist, is presented to the world, four things will happen. Wonder, worship, words, and war. Wonder, he will be good looking. He will be something to look at. He's going to do things that are going to marvel everybody. Everybody will be in awe of what he's able to do. Worship, he will organize and promote the worship of himself, which is actually worship of Satan. And it will make, the, it'll make it the official religion of the entire world. Words, a great speaker, influencer, storyteller. 
Most, if not all, dictators have risen to power by controlling people with their words. And some of what he says will be truth, and some will be utter blasphemy. He tells them just enough truth to get them to believe. And war, this is my favorite part, God will permit God will permit Antichrist to war against his people and even to defeat some of them. The world's population will be divided, those with their name written in the book of life and those who have taken the mark of the beast. But God, again, is all over this. He is allowing this to happen. This Antichrist will be powerful, but he will be limited. So he's not God and never will be. He's limited. He's limited in this space in time. He only has a few years to persuade people to uh, his way of thinking and acting. Keep in mind that the beast is a counterfeit Christ. The world will not worship the Christ today, and they, but they will bow down to the Antichrist because he's going to be amazing if they could only read the Bible. <laughs> so how do we avoid deception? There's only one way to do that and that is to study the truth. It is said that bank tellers are trained to spot counterfeit money by looking at the real stuff all the time. The Secret Service website, you can learn how to spout spout counterfeit money. You just try to say that one. (laughs) It tells you what the real stuff is supposed to look like, feel like, even smell like, what you should see on it. And then it'll also tell you uh, some of what you will see on counterfeits that have tried to been pushed through. The point of the web page is that you will know the real stuff well enough, you won't be fooled by the fake stuff. It's the same with knowing truth from falsehood, and in this case, knowing the real Jesus from the anti-Christ that is coming, and also is some are here today. We will be able to tell the false Christ by knowing the real one. Do you know Jesus Christ? That only happens by studying his word. Although Satan is powerful, he is not God's equal, and God gives us power to overcome him. Final section, ladies, here we go. We've completed the unholy trinity. This picture is from Revelation, illustrated like I used in the vision um, in chapter 4. Wow, that's all I have to say. It's quite something. Satan is the counterfeit father, the beast is the counterfeit Christ, and the false prophet is the counterfeit Holy Spirit. That is their unholy trinity. Many believe he is from the Jewish nation because he is from the earth. Verse 11 says, It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. Warren Wiersbe says, He will have the character of a lamb, docile and obedient, but the absence of a crown indicates that his authority is not political. He will begin a new religion that everyone can embrace, a mixture of the world's main religions intertwined with occultism. That just gives me the creeps. He will have no problem setting up false religion that will attract millions of followers. He is turning people away from God even today. Here's a good word for you, word for the day, apostasy. It means a major departure from a religious or political belief. Sounds like what's happening here, right? 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. It's like God knew we were going to need to know what was coming because he said it already back in 1 Timothy. Wow. Ladies, now is the time to put your stick in the ground and to claim that God is the only God that I worship He is the God of the Bible, and he has, his son is the only way to Jesus Christ, um, to him through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There is no other God. That is the it. This is what the two witnesses that Erica talked about last week were all about. They were ministering at the temple in Jerusalem until the Antichrist actually had them killed. The false prophet will have those he has deceived then build this image And he's given power from the Antichrist to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. 
This was referenced in that last section where I talked about them building an image into the temple. And this is called the abomination of desolation. An idol of the beast is set up in the temple of Jerusalem. The Jewish people had just rebuilt this, looking to serve their Messiah. And this is what will be placed into that temple. Satan couldn't get the worship he wanted in heaven, so he goes to the next most holy place, which is the Jewish temple. Everyone will be forced to bow down and worship the image, or you'll be killed. And if that wasn't bad enough, you will be required to be given a mark on your right hand or on your forehead that signifies your allegiance to the beast in order to buy or sell. This mark is to mark, mock the seal that God has placed on his followers. This mark emphasizes, this mark of the beast emphasizes the loyalty to the beast, but the seal placed by God emphasizes ownership by God. This mark is noted in verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Everybody has that. You've heard some story, right, about 666 and how horrible it is. To date, with all of man's imaginative calculations, no one knows the meaning of the number. If you do a Google search for the number 666, you will find 858 million results. Now, I've, used, I've uh, talked about Greg Laurie and his book that he has on Revelation, which was published last year. At that time when he did it, it was 584 million results, and now we're at 858 million. Wow, so people are really thinking about this. So we have some in this room who will remain nameless, Erica, um, who said that there was possibly even that the 666 could have returned, could have referred to Ronald Wilson Reagan. Each of those names have six letters. He survived a mortal wound. His first lady wore a lot of red, red dragon, right? And upon his retirement, he moved into a house at 666 St. Cloud Street. <laughs> he did change the address, by the way. Nonetheless, <laughs> I don't think it was him. So 50 years ago, this seemed so far-fetched. But with advances in technology, this could be happening in a minute, and this could be done. Now we're going to go back to verse 11 and this woman, right, where she's fleeing. Um, this, go back to verse, and he speaks like a dragon. So you've talked about uh, this beast who has um, the, comes like a lamb, but he speaks like the dragon. That means that you can make anything sound plausible. It doesn't mean you're breathing fire. It means you're going to be very, you're able to manipulate people easily. That's why he's going to be so successful. Today we talked about we talk about tolerance of acts that the Bible clearly condemns. There will be more and more tolerance for any faith except for those intolerant faith believing Christians. Who could be against tolerance? How could reasonable, rational people be against a woman's reproductive rights or death with dignity or even religious tolerance? These are rhetorical questions. <laughs> but the new verbiage for a new time. Like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, his mouth will be actively opposing the word of God. All we need to hear is the word of God. That is all that matters, and the cure to the deceptions and the imitations that we will see more and more. Satan is a terrible taskmaster. Here is a helpful quotation from Thomas Brooks, who was a Puritan who wrote a book uh, on Satan's onslaught against the Christian soul. It says, he promises the best but pays the worst. He promises honor but pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure but pays with pain. He promises profit but pays with loss. And he promises life but pays with death. Temptations are certain to ring your doorbell, but it's your own fault if you ask him in for dinner. Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than of Christ. Although Satan is powerful, he is not God's equal, and God gives us the power to overcome him. 
Did you guys know that a doomsday clock actually exists? Did you know about that? I was shocked. Um, it was established in 1947 by a group of atomic scientists to warn the world about the danger of nuclear weapons. The idea is that when the clock strikes midnight, straight up and down, that the world would be at its end. In 1947, they set the clock at six minutes to 12. And then in 2010, they moved it back to seven minutes because they thought they'd made some progress. And then in 2015, it got moved to five. In 2018, it got moved to two. And then January 27th of 1921, and still to this day, it is moved to 100 seconds before 12. While this doomsday clock is just a prediction, revelation is real. The end is near, and we can see every day, but so also will be our new beginning in Christ. That's the good news, but the bad news is that it's going to have to get worse before it gets better. So we need to be ready. We need God's power to overcome what Satan will throw at us every day. Open your Bibles daily, ladies, so that you know the truth and that you'll be able to discern truth from the lies. Are you so caught up with what Satan is doing that you're missing what is God, how God is moving in your life? Dear God, help us to weigh what we see and hear by the truths of your word. Thank you for triumphing over evil through the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.